In this flyover, the Cape Star factory explodes. With progress. Astronauts undergo emergency training. You heard that right. And Kennedy Space Center burns. But don't worry, that's okay. Let's get right into it, starting of course with SpaceX's Roberts Road facility. But first, I just want to quickly mention that this video was made possible by Brilliant. More on them in a bit. At Roberts Road, the construction mounts for Tower Segment 5 now sit bare, with that segment having rolled to Launch Complex 39A on July 27th. We can also see Tower Segment 6 being prepared for rollout during this flyover. In fact, Tower Segment 6 rolled the same day this flyover was shot, just a little later in the day. Construction has begun on Tower Segment 9, the final segment needed before SpaceX puts a cap segment on top. This segment will hold all the pulleys and various mechanisms needed to lift and lower the chopstick carriage. In fact, this beam right here in the center of this section is precisely the one where that hardware will be located. As for segment 8, we can now see scaffolding on it, indicating that SpaceX is preparing this segment to roll to Complex 39A. Segment 7 is already prepared for its roll, which is expected to come within a week from now. This has been quite a rapid rollout for the tower segments, or at least it's just felt that way. Exciting! Meanwhile, the tents used to assemble the GSC cryopipes for the tower have moved closer to the tower build area, and strange coils of wiring have appeared near them. Perhaps now work there is shifting from GSE plumbing to wiring. At the chopstick assembly area, the chopsticks have been laid on their side, likely for installation of the rail segments on the top surface of the arms that interface with the lifting points on boosters and ships. As for the carriage, we can see that the grabby parts that hold on to the launch tower, technical term, were moved near the carriage system work area. Additionally, right next door to the chopsticks, scaffolding surrounding the ship quick disconnect arm has been removed, potentially indicating that work on the arm is finished. At the construction area for the Cape Mega Bay, the pouring of concrete for the foundation appears to be wrapping up. While we're waiting for the structure to begin rising from the ground, teams have made a makeshift ramp that allows vehicles to access the interior of the bay. Meanwhile, to the east, at the Star Factory, the building continues to rise at a staggering pace. The roof is expanded, and columns are being installed further to the south. The west side of the building is being painted white, and the concrete floor continues to be poured and expanded to the rest of the building, again, mostly to the south. I sort of feel like we have a race of the Star Factories going on here, with one being built in Boca Chica and one being built at the Cape. The Star Factory building, of course, takes the place of all the tent structures that we see at Starbase and will likewise be the place in Florida where ships and boosters are manufactured and possibly stored. Moving on to SpaceX's Pad 39A, Tower Segment 5 was lifted into place a day after it rolled out. This segment is the one that will host the ship quick disconnect arm, which will eventually provide fluids and power to ships while they're stacked on top of boosters at 39A. Next up at the pad, the new large tank near the tower is currently undergoing installation on the stand we've been watching get constructed. It's believed that this is a cryogenic storage tank due to its double shell design. Speaking of tanks, the two large horizontal tanks that were delivered shortly after the previous flyover have also been installed near that large tank. Also, work on the old shuttle hydrogen sphere is continuing to progress, with workers continuing to refurbish the tank in preparation for its conversion for use with methane. This seems to include either cleaning or painting of the sphere, or perhaps both, because it looks visibly more white than it did on previous flyovers. Back at the launch pad itself, the Falcon 9 Transporter Erector, or TE, was not at the ramp as usual. Instead, it was back inside the HIF, or Horizontal Integration Facility in preparation for the launch of the Starlink Group 4-26 mission on August 9th. That launch has already happened by the time you're watching this video, so hopefully you were watching it on our live stream, or not, I mean, it's your loss. Moving right along to SpaceX's other pad on the Space Coast, Slick 40, the transporter erector has been retracted following the launch of the Korean Pathfinder Lunar Orbiter just last week. Another launch may be on tap from this pad in the next week or so, so stay tuned for that as well. Moving on again, this time to Port Canaveral, Support ship Megan was in port, with SpaceX crews as well as astronauts on board undergoing emergency evacuation trials. Here you can even see a yellow emergency rescue raft as well as a Dragon training capsule. Note the astronauts, the blue flight suits are a dead giveaway. 
Practicing to rapidly and safely aggress from a splashdown capsule, should the need arise, is a necessary and important part of training. In the same way you need to know how to get out of a plane if you have a water landing, astronauts need to know how to properly handle an emergency after splashdown. Next up, over at Launch Complex 39B, the launch complex for SLS, the pad is still sitting empty. SLS is preparing to roll back to the launch pad no earlier than August 18th. We're currently just under three weeks from the first launch attempt on August 29th, and hopefully we'll see SLS back out the pad during our next flyover. The Artemis program is getting into full swing, and it's fantastic to see, especially with SLS because it feels like a long time coming. We'll of course be rolling out in full force to cover SLS's orbital flight test, so thanks for all the support and stay tuned for shiploads of epic SLS content. Shifting gears again now and heading over to Blue Origin's Launch Complex 36, we can see their two test tanks out in the wild. Close to the pad is the second stage test article for New Glenn. While Jarvis, the name of the reusable second stage Pathfinder tank, is still sitting at LC-12. Both tanks appear to be unchanged from our last flyover. Also at Launch Complex 12, a new blue latticed steel structure has been spotted. At roughly 7 meters wide, this could be part of a structural test stand for the New Glenn second stage. Also at the pad are two more structures that seem to resemble launch mounts. Both have an opening of 7 meters, potentially indicating that they will be used as test stands for New Glenn hardware. Thanks to Harry Stranger for sharing these stellar views. Get it? It's stellar because they're from a satellite? Okay, I'll go. Meanwhile, over at Blue's main campus at Exploration Park, work continues on the warehouse expansion, with steel and other structural materials being moved into place. While there isn't much to be seen at the warehouse still, work does seem to be progressing elsewhere as Blue continues to prepare land for the construction of more manufacturing facilities. The Tucat building has also made some progress, as the big metal grid we saw constructed on our last flyover was put into place on the frame on the side of the building. In addition to this, it appears as if the roof of the building is nearing completion. Next up at Blue's Exploration Park campus, we got a rare peek into the main manufacturing building just the other day, during the New Shepard launch broadcast. Among the things we saw, there was an aft section which contains New Glenn's landing legs, as well as a forward section which holds the four fins that will be used to assist with landing. There were also multiple barrel sections and domes visible, as well as a close-up of the New Glenn second stage test article we mentioned a moment ago. Finally, there was also a fairing half visible. With a massive amount of cars at the campus and the footage we've been shown, it seems Blue are really starting to hit their stride, and hopefully we see more test hardware outside soon. Moving on to other companies and pads at the Cape, over at Launch Complex 16, Relativity's pad, we do not see much of a change compared to our last flyover. The Terran 1 first stage is still hanging out at the pad and waiting for its first orbital test flight. This vehicle was successfully static fired recently as confirmed by Tim Ellis on Twitter. But wait, there's more! If you want to know all about Relativity, or if you already know about them and want to learn even more, we had CEO Tim Ellis on NSF Live this weekend with all kinds of amazing information about the company and their rockets, Terran 1 and Terran R. Go check that video out next if you haven't already. We'll put a link in the description. Super cool of Tim to come on the show and for Relativity as a whole for being open to that as a company. As can be seen on some of our pictures near the launch and landing facility, or more formally, the shuttle landing facility, the ground there is visibly charred. But don't panic, this is all the result of controlled burns at Kennedy Space Center. This comes from the fact that the Space Center is in what's known as Lightning Alley, an area that is very active with lightning strikes. To manage the land and prevent uncontrolled fires, certain areas are burned in what's known as a controlled fire to manage the spread of wildfires and make them much more unlikely. While underbrush and flammable material is prevented from burning because of human development nearby, it can counterintuitively make fires more intense when they do happen. So these controlled burns are an important tool in terms of fire management. This is just one of the ways that Kennedy Space Center operates in harmony with the Wildlife Preserve to protect the habitat as well as its operational assets. Speaking of important tools, if you want to learn STEM topics interactively and at your own pace, our sponsor for this video, Brilliant, is the tool for you. If you're anything like me, you learn best from hands-on experience. With Brilliant, you get fun and interactive lessons in all kinds of STEM topics that help you learn more effectively than just watching or reading something online. Brilliant uses examples, diagrams, and simple questions to help guide you through topics, which is way more conducive to actually retaining the information. Whether you want to do a deep dive on coding or just to brush up on your everyday math, Brilliant has a course for you. 
As usual, I'm going to suggest that viewers of this channel might enjoy learning about the famous rocket equation as part of the classical mechanics course. Or, if you're not ready for that yet, the everyday math course will give you the foundational bedrock you need to feel comfortable diving into something more advanced. Get started learning on Brilliant for free today with a special offer just for our viewers. Visit brilliant.org slash NASA Spaceflight or click the link in the description. The first 200 people to sign up will get 20% off their annual premium membership. Thanks again to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Before we end this flyover, we want to mention our pilot Vance and thank him for all of the flights he did with us, including this one. This could be his last flight with us, so we wanted to give him a special shout out. Thanks for your skillful and diligent work, Vance. May your skies always be blue and your winds fair. Alright, that's it for this week's flyover. Thanks for watching, everybody.